Bismillah, alhamdulillah, wa salatu wa salamu ala rasulillah wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa man wala. Allahumma bika amsayna wa bika asbahna wa bika nahya wa bika namut wa ilayka al-masir. Amsayna wa amsal mulku lillahi rabbil alameen. Allahumma inna nas'aduka khayra hadihi al-layla. Fathaha, wa nasraha, wa nuraha, wa barakataha, wa hudaha. Wa na'udhu bika min shaddi ma fiha, wa shaddi ma ba'da. We will continue with verse 17 if you want to follow along with the PowerPoint or your own translation, inshallah. أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم إنا بلوناهم كما بلونا أصحاب الجنة إذ أقسموا ليصرمنها مصبحين ولا يستثنون فطاف عليها طائف من ربك وهم نائمون فأصبحت كالصريم فتنادوا مصبحين أن اغدوا على حرثكم إن كنتم صارمين فانطلقوا وهم يتخافتون ألا يدخلنها اليوم عليكم مسكين وغدوا على حرد قادرين فلما رأوها قالوا إنا لضالون بل نحن محرومون قال أوسطهم ألم أقل لكم لولا تسبحون قالوا سبحان ربنا إنا كنا ظالمين فأقبل بعضهم على بعض يتلاومون قالوا يا ويلنا إنا كنا طاغين عسى ربنا أن يبدلنا خيرا منها إنا إلى ربنا راغبون كذلك العذاب ولعذاب الآخرة أكبر لو كانوا يعلمون Going back to where we stopped last week, verse uh, 10 to 16. So the passage of 10 to 16, we mentioned that a person of Quraysh, an elite of Quraysh, an arrogant person, was not being named here. Uh, and some of the scholars believe that it was Al-Walid ibn al-Mughira. We mentioned that uh, three of his ten sons became Muslim, including the famous Khalid ibn al-Walid, as well as his brother Al-Walid ibn al-Walid. Now, the verses begin by describing in this passage some of the characteristics of evil and some of the characteristics of this individual two of which he did not know about until this revelation. So going back to where we started. Uh, verse 10, this is what we covered, and 11 and 12. Do not yield, do not give in to any contemptible swearer, someone who's always swearing by God. Why? Because this person is a pathological liar. Number two, so the next ayah, do not basically give in to this person who is a backbiter, slander monger, someone who is creating gossip, creating fitna, hearing from one person, going to another and creating a rift between them. Or a person who is a hinder to good, to khayr, to anyone who is sinful and aggressive. And so we established from these verses a number of points and we covered these last week. And then we have some new characteristics as well. This is the one that he himself did not know about. This person is cruel, moreover, an illegitimate pretender. An illegitimate pretender meaning what? The word utul generally is used for someone, an individual who might be aggressive, strong, but also what? Greedy, strong in terms of how greedy they are in eating and drinking, quarrelsome in their arguments. So they are seen by other people as someone who loves to eat a lot and someone who argues a lot and someone who is uh, basically reckless, someone who is cruel, someone who is harsh. They transgress lines when they talk to people. Utul. As well, in addition to that, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying this person is zanim. The word zanim is used to describe a person of illegitimate birth. 
who does not in fact belong to a family but has joined it, meaning what? Some other way for them to have joined that family. And I'm being very cautious with my words, but in other words, he himself did not know that he was illegitimate. And some of the commentators of uh, Quran from the earliest uh, of generations, they said this, this word could also refer to a person who was notorious amongst the community for his evil doing. And both of these meanings are accepted and they can be combined as well. So Al-Walid al mughira is the likeliest person this was referring to Allahu Adam. An kana da mali wa bani, the next ayah. Allah said, and this ayah, pay attention to the following point, it can be uh, a continuation of what Allah is saying and it can be what? The prequel to the next ayah. So it can be a sequel and a prequel at the same time. A continuation of the last verse and a prequel to the next verse. An kana da mali wa bani. Just because he has wealth and family, wealth and sons. So he has a lot of wealth, and this was because of uh, his status. And he has a lot of offspring. We, we mentioned before, he had at least 10 sons, Al-Walid ibn al So just because he has wealth and sons, When our verses are recited to him, he says, these are fairy tales, these are ancient fables. Now, this is the continuation. Now, what if we took the verse before it? You have all these descriptions of this evil man. It does not matter to him because what he has, a lot of wealth and sons. My dear brothers and sisters, these are the same words we still hear today. Today, uh, 1400 plus years later, you still hear arrogant people with similar descriptions who are very uh, boastful, very cruel, very arrogant. They talk down about others. They mock the religious community. They mock Muslims. And this has always been the case. And they think they are upon truth. And when they hear about the Quran, the revelation of God, they say, what? No, this is perhaps a fairy tale. What do you mean? The one who studies the Quran can see very rationally, if you are intelligent, that this cannot be man-made. But they have not even considered that. Their arrogance is too strong. It is clouding their judgments, their ability to see. This evil person and some people today. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the end of this passage, We will soon mark his uh, snout or his nose. What does that mean? So because of this, some scholars say there's some evidence that this is referring to Al-Walid ibn Mughira one of the leaders of the Meccan opposition to Islam. He rejected the Prophet Sallallahu insulted him, attacked him, and of course they tried to invite him and tempt him as well, and he refused all these bribes. So the Quran responded, Allah responded by listing 10 of his qualities, 10 of the qualities of Al-Walid ibn Mughira. Again, two of which he did not know about before, the fact that he was born out of wedlock, so he's illegitimate in terms of the family, and that his nose would be marked. What does that mean? His nose would be marked, meaning it would be chopped off. Several years later, this took place at the Battle of Badr. This is what had happened to Al-Walid ibn Mughira. And it was almost as, as though to say this is a fulfillment of this prophecy, this uh, revelation from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala from before. Now, in addition to this, Sanasimuhu ala al-Khurtum can also refer to on the Day of Judgment and in this world in terms of disgracing him. So sometimes you'll see, especially in some cultures, and this is not uh, uncommon today, an arrogant person raising their chin and their nose up like this, walking around as though they own the world. And in reality, because of his arrogance and, and thinking that his status would protect him, that was the very same thing that caused him to be disgraced. Who is Al-Walid ibn Mughira today? Who follows his legacy or cares about his legacy? He's a disgraced man in history. He's a loser in history. And then you study the person he opposed, the final messenger of God, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, the most mentioned man in the world, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Allahumma salli ala Muhammad. You say his name all the time. We mention his name throughout the day, and his name is always being mentioned around the world, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And in fact, today, the most common boy's name in the world, Muhammad, with all of its variations. You cannot compare the two. And yet that man had his nose up as though he owned the world as though his wealth was going to protect him in the future or protect him in the grave or protect him on the day of judgment. That type of arrogance is one of the reasons that people will be disgraced on their faces on the day of resurrection. They will be humiliated on that day. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala purify our hearts, grant us clarity and utilize us for khair, Allahumma ameen. So this is the passage of 10 to 16. After this, the attention shifts to something very different. And I'm going to ask you, inshallah, so be ready for this question later on. What is the link between the first part of Surah Al-Qalam and this next passage? This next passage in Surah Al-Qalam, 
from 17 all the way to 33. This is a story about the people of the garden. These are the people of the Jannah or the Bustan, the people who owned a garden. And there are some opinions about what this was referring to as a context before we get into the story. In short, some of these farmers, they, they, they had access to this land with uh, its fruits and its harvest. They planned, they, they plotted, and they schemed amongst themselves to go early in the morning to take the harvest so that the poor people would not show up and then get any of it or ask for any of it. So they would not see that there was actual harvest. But when they got to their harvest the next morning with this evil intention, they found that it had been destroyed during the night. This is the summary of the story. Now, there's some context according to some of the, the books of Tafsir. Uh, I, I did not myself go back and trace these ahadith to see if they are authentic or not. But since it is a story and this is found in Tafsir al baghawi and others, the, the short context for it is that there was a pious man who owned a, a large uh, plot of land with a lot of uh, vegetation, a lot of agriculture, and he had some children. And he was a very pious man. He tried to raise righteous children, but they were not like their father. They saw, for example, poor people uh, taking some of the, the fruits, or taking some of what they had, so they could not sell it and make more profits. The father passed away, this, this grateful, generous father, and he gave the land to his children. When he was alive, he used to be very generous. When he passed away, his children started realizing, if we want to make more money, we're going to have to keep more of the fruits for ourselves so that the poor people cannot access it. This is the context of the story. So looking at verses 17 and 18, for example, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Inna balawnahum. Who is this referring to? We have tested them. This is referring to the Meccans. Inna balawnahum as we kama balawna ashab al-jannati idh aqsamu la yasrimunnaha musbihi. We tested the people of Mecca, Quraysh, as we tested the owners of the garden. Now we're going to get into the story. But before we get into the story, what does this mean? Allah is testing the people of Mecca as the people of the garden were tested. Anything you have in this world is a test. Anything you have, any blessing you have, it is a test. You have an electronic device, it's a test. You have clothes, that's a test. You have food today, that is a test. Any kind of wealth, any possession, anything at all, these are all tests. Yes, they are blessings. And these are blessings you will be asked about. You'll be asked on that day about all the blessings that you had. So Allah gave the people of Mecca all that they had. They had status. They had honored the people of the Arabian Peninsula used to go there. It was known as uh, an economic powerhouse in, in the peninsula. And yet many of them, the, the elites of Quraysh, rejected the final messenger when revelation came down. So Allah says, now we're turning our attention to a link between the people of Mecca and to the story the people who own the garden. These are the three sons, or let's say these are the people who own the garden without specifying who. What would they say? They swore they would go the next morning. We will take the, the, the fruits for ourselves. We will har harvest all of this for us. And they did not say, inshallah. They did not leave any room or thought for the will of God. This is the first part of the story. And we want to take some lessons before we move on. Number one, we should consider the saying of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in Surah Al-Kahf, which resembles this. So you have the parable of the owners of the two gardens, and you also have what? The saying of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, وَلَا تَقُولَنَّ لِشَيْءٍ إِنِّي فَاعِلٌ ذَلِكَ غَدًا إِلَّا أَنْ يَشَاءَ اللَّهِ Do not say I'm going to do something tomorrow without saying if Allah wills, by the will of Allah. So this is a lesson. You also have in Surah Al-Kahf the lesson of the, the owners of the two gardens, one who was righteous, one who was not, and the garden was destroyed. A second reflection here. So again, that was the first link synthesis between two different surah and the Quran. A second uh, reflection here. These owners of the garden were so confident. They were so sure about their power and their authority that they swore that they would go and pluck the fruits of the garden the very next morning. Without feeling, to, without feeling the need to say, inshallah, by God's will. Only an arrogant person will know this and not say inshallah intentionally. Every single humble human being who realizes who you are to, to God, to the creator, you must say inshallah, inshallah. And of course, don't misuse inshallah. Don't use it in the wrong way, number one. And number two, don't lie with inshallah. This is very problematic. What do we mean, what do we mean exactly by number one? Don't say inshallah when it does not apply. Uh, yani, are, are you doing well inshallah so th this is like someone trying to use inshallah for everything generally speaking you say inshallah when you're talking about something you're going to do right I'm going to go to the store inshallah 
I'm going to see you tomorrow, inshallah. See you later, inshallah. So you're you're talking about something of the future. How did that happen in the past, inshallah? No, this does not apply. So I'm just reminding us here, there's a way to use inshallah. It means by God's will, right? God willing. And it's okay to use this in English as well. God willing. And in fact, a number of uh, non-Muslims, when we speak with them, don't be embarrassed to say God willing. Right now, if you're typing up an email for a coworker or your supervisor or something happens and you forget you're talking to a non-Muslim and you type inshallah, don't worry about it. But if you insist on saying it, you can say God willing. There's nothing wrong with that. And in fact, you cannot get punished for that. Inshallah. Number three, why were they going so early to the garden before people arrived? Simply put, so you understand the story, they wanted to take the fruits from the garden. So poor people would not see it or have access to it. This is exactly what's happening here. Number four, a reminder. Kindness, when you're kind to other people, is a door of blessings for oneself. You want more of your garden, give more to the poor. Don't hide more of it. Don't restrict it. You want more blessings in your life, share more of it with others. Share that rizq with others. The one who gives, charity does not lose or decrease in their wealth. This is a promise from Allah and a promise from his messenger, sallallahu alayhi wa But they did not do that. They thought they were in control of their rizq. And sometimes you think you're in control of your wealth. But the reality is you cannot control the concept of barakah, the concept of blessings, that you have $10, but it multiplies to 100 or it's utilized as 1,000. And that person who, for example, held back $5 in charity thought, I'm saving more money. But in reality, what did they do? They prevented themselves from access to $100 worth in that $5. And so this is something we must keep in mind. Number five. They did not say inshallah. And there's something interesting about this here. I, wa I wonder if any of you noticed this, but they're intending to go to sleep and wake up and do what? Something good or something evil. So we're talking about utilizing the word inshallah. But I'm asking you, are they intending to do something good or something evil? Go ahead and let us know in the chat. It's very simple. They're planning to wake up and prevent uh, poor people from access to food, access to fruits. So their intention is to commit a sin. Their intention is one of evil. Jazakumullah khairan. And yet Allah says, وَلَا يَسْتَثْنُونَ They did not say insha'Allah. Why is this interesting? Because generally speaking, when someone is intending to do something evil, or they even uh, verbalize it, and they say, I'm going to do such and such, or let's do such and such, generally speaking, a person won't say insha'Allah. وَلَا يَسْتَثْنُونَ so why, why is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentioning this here? Why is that so important? Is, is it because they did not say insha'Allah that they were not able to commit a sin? Or is there another reason? And so the reminder here is that a person who regularly says insha'Allah will realize that at times saying it as a habit in life will protect them from committing a sin. So if you think of a sin and you think to yourself, I'm going to do it, and you cannot get yourself to think or say, inshallah, then that there's a problem with the action that you're doing. Because, and this is the next point, if you say inshallah and you're talking about a sin and you are sincere and you know what inshallah means, what are you going to realize? What am I saying? How can I possibly say I'm going to do such and such by Allah's will? I'm going to do something evil. So the, the phrase itself will perhaps remind a person in that moment what they are intending to do and they're talking about Allah and they're referencing God. So perhaps they will discontinue with their intention and action. Perhaps they won't proceed with that sin. If you are in the habit of always thinking, inshallah, by Allah's will, and you are always saying, inshallah, then you are more likely when you fall into a thought or a trap or a whisper or you saw something, the thought of inshallah will perhaps protect you. And that is from the blessing of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for the one who always thinks of him. This is not something people talk about often, but insha'Allah is utilized to protect oneself from sin as well. So we mentioned before, one of the traits of this evil person, there were 10 characteristics. One of them was that he was manna'an lil khayr. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, do not incline to these types of evil. Do not give in to them. Manna'an lil khayr mu'tadin athib. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala here is reminding us that these people as well were manna'an lil khayr. They were preventing something that was good they were they were restricting something that was good in society or access to something that was good and in fact it wasn't just something good it was something that people needed to survive to live think about this often what is your role when it comes to opening the doors of khayr rather than just restricting them 
Jazakum wa And the second we mentioned before is the test, the trial. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala blessed the people of Mecca with something, and they, many of them, not all of them, they rejected the blessing. They rejected the messenger. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tests all of us with something. Every single person here. We are all tested with so many blessings. Allah says, we will test you all with difficulty and with ease as a trial for you. That's your test. And everyone's test is unique. Ultimately, after your test is done, when you die, your test time is over and you will return to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for your accountability. So every single one of us should assess frequently. Everything you have, wallahi, it is a blessing. Look at all that you have. Look at the fact that we have here in the 21st century during this pandemic. Uh, yes, an unprecedented moment in all of our lives. And yes, it is getting difficult for many people. May Allah make it easy for you and allow you to be optimistic and allow you to adjust and relieve you of your hardships and protect us all and our loved ones and our communities and relieve all of us from this pandemic. Allahumma ameen. May Allah grant shifa to all of those who seek shifa and all of those who have any illnesses whatsoever. Allahumma ameen. Having said that, Think about what you have access to today. Blessings we don't think about all the time. The clothes on your body, the food that you have, the fact that you have internet and you are able to study the book of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala during this pandemic. The fact that there is a camera right now in front of me. The fact that we are able to communicate. These are blessings from Allah. Are you taking advantage of your blessings? So many people have access to the internet and they have no benefit whatsoever. All evil, all useless activities. And other people have access to the internet and they are not wasting time. An opportunity for khayr, they take it. An opportunity for sadaqah, they take it. An opportunity for ilm, they take it. An opportunity to connect and say salam to a brother or sister from around the world, they take it. Take advantage of every blessing. It is a trial for you. Some people are tested with blessings and some people are tested with difficulties, meaning what uh, struggles in their lives. And no two people have the same test. And don't look at other people's test in order to feel bad about yours. No, alhamdulillah, for what you have, you will be held accountable in proportion to what you have, for what you have. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala allow us all to pass our test and to use every blessing in the best manner possible. This is gratitude to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This is to be a grateful human being. Moving on to the next passage, 19, 20, 21, and 22. What happened? They intended to destroy this garden how to take away all the access of khayr. In other words, because they were preventing poor people from access to the garden, they were creating the act of destruction that would come to them. Meaning what they were basically causing this, they were asking Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to be punished by doing this. As they were sleeping, a torment from Allah came, a disaster came and struck the garden that they had, that they wanted to basically use for evil by preventing, preventing the poor people from accessing it when these poor people depended on it to live. And this is what they were depending on for a long time before when their father used to be alive. So by morning time, it was stripped bare. It was a desolate land. It was like ashes. It became like ashes. By daybreak, they called out to one another. What do we have to do today? We have a plan. Go early to your harvest. Let's go quickly. They are very aggressive. They are very determined. What are you determined about? What do you drive yourself for? When it's time for salah, do you say, I have to get up for salah. I have to do this. I have to do that. They were going with some passion. Hurry up and go pick your harvest if you want to take all the fruit. And I want us to consider here a number of points. Number one, the sleep of the oppressor or a person of evil is a blessing to others. Consider this, that if people feel happy that a person of evil disappears or becomes sick or goes to sleep, then there's a problem with this person's actions. All right? And this is something that is said in many expressions in many different ways, in many languages. Number two, the one who becomes arrogant and oppresses other people should never think themselves invis invincible. Why? The punishment Allah, from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala might not be through people. The punishment might come down from above. And we see this all the time in society. So many people, overnight, their businesses are gone. And then they admit what I had been committing this and that. I was doing this and that. I had committed uh, this kind of sin. The punishment might come from above. Do not ever become arrogant. Do not ever become prideful. And do not ever become uh, complacent with your sin just because you're not seeing a punishment from God. 
with your shortcoming. May Allah protect us. May Allah protect us. May Allah protect us. Number three, of the worst habits and of the most foolish is for someone to sleep with the intention to commit a sin the next morning. For their temporary death, their sleep may lead to punishment the next morning, or that sleep may end up becoming their permanent death. You do not ever sleep with the intention to wake up and commit a sin. May Allah protect us. Number four, make your last deed before you go to sleep, one of ibadah, one of righteousness. This is why the sunnah of the Prophet ﷺ was to recite some Qur'an and make some specific dua. Because if you die in your sleep, you die upon fitrah. You die upon the natural disposition. You die upon Islam and you are guaranteed Jannah. Now, if someone knows this, that if you say this dua before you sleep sincerely, this dua includes so many components of submission, repentance, gratitude, humility. If you say this dua and you die, and the Prophet ﷺ says you die upon fitrah, you're guaranteed Jannah. Why would you not say it every single night? Spend five minutes, less than five minutes, every night with specific verses of the Quran. And very few dua, and you are guaranteed that if you died in your sleep, as many people die in their sleep every night around the world, you are guaranteed paradise. Do not dare allow yourself to make the last deed before you sleep a sinful one, in which you were watching something you should not watch, talking to someone you should not talk to, listening to something you should not listen to, reading something inappropriate, saying something inappropriate or harsh, or hurting somebody else. Make sure the last deed before you sleep is a righteous one. Number five, the prevention of khayr, manna'in al-khayr, is a trait of the disbelievers who are far from God. Not the believers. Meaning what? A believer should not fall into this sin. Yes, do we as believers sometimes fall into sins? It is, yes, it is of course something that people fall into. It is not something that we ever encourage in our societies. Did you ever attend an Islamic function and hear people say, go on, hold on to your wealth. Go on, be stingy. Focus only on yourself. No, that's not the Islamic theology. Because we know that rizq, Provisions comes from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We know that in Islam, all of us as a collective do not think about individualism. We think about social collective. We think about societal benefits. And Islam gives preferences to society over the one individual. This is why when you consider the philosophies of our times, the ideologies, the movements that people are advocating for, or if you studied it, liberal philosophy, when you look at politics today and the debates people have, there's a huge emphasis uh, by some people and movements on individualism, the freedom of choice, meaning the individual chooses whatever lifestyle they want, even if it is immoral. And this is not what Islam calls for. Islam calls for the protection of society and social values, moral values. And that comes from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So this person here, manna'in lil-khayr, this is a trait of people who are far from God. Be a source of khayr for others. Be a facilitator of khayr for others. You might be young, you might be old, you might uh, be in a specific situation in your life, regardless of who you are, always be a door of khayr for others. When you're around other people, do something good for them, be kind to them. Uh, even a smile is charity to them. When you know someone is in need of help, that's better for you than what i'tikaf in the masjid of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So be a source of khayr, be the opposite of this disbeliever who's mentioned in Surah Al-Qalam. Man na'i lil khayr, mu'tadin athim. May Allah protect us and use all of us to be sources of goodness, sources of help, sources of assistance to other people all the time. Allahumma ameen. Number six, the world can change while you sleep for the one who created and controls the world does not sleep. Glory be to the one who is never affected by any kind of exhaustion or any kind of fatigue. The one who does not need to rest. You might be sleeping, and as is the, is the case in the story, their garden was wiped out. The world can change overnight, and the world seemingly changed to Allah overnight with this pandemic. So you're reminded what? You're reminded to never become arrogant, to bid farewell to this world all the time, and to realize that things will always change in Adunia. Nothing remains in this world. Nothing is permanent in life. And even your stages of existence and our stages as human beings, they're constantly changing. You might see changes in your wealth. You might see changes in your education, your health, whatever it may be. Changes will always come. Expect that. Expect that there will always be change in this world. And in this case, these people slept and forgot about the fact that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the one who created and controls the world, he is not affected by rest like they are. And so their evil plot came with its punishment. And finally, number seven, 
taking care of the poor and the needy in society is a source of khair, a source of blessings. We are in their service, not vice versa, because the source of blessings from Allah will come through serving them for their status. These righteous people, specific individuals, and we might have many opportunities like this. Perhaps a nation is given justice, is given status, is given honor, and is blessed due to the dua of the weak and the oppressed in that society. Do not ignore someone who is struggling more than you financially. Do not disregard people who, whom, upon whom others are looking down. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala guide us. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make us in the service of others. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala utilize all of us for khayr. Allah ameen. There's so much that can be done. There's so many campaigns. There's always something happening. Look for opportunities and be amongst the first to race to them. And when you hear of an opportunity, share it with others as well. But do not just share it. Be part of it, inshallah. Now, I want to ask another critical thinking question before our next passage. So you're going to have to think about this one. How can you link this passage that we just covered how can you link this passage, verses 19 to 22, with the concept of the pen, al-qalam? So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala swore by the pen. So the first link between these two, and this is a suggested link, a synthesis of sorts, is that, as we said before, pens are considered small and insignificant, but they are indeed powerful tools. And the lesson that we mentioned earlier in the surah is that it's not about the quantity or physical property of something, it's about the potential of that thing and the quality. And you have here a tool that was not used properly. You have here potential, what is the potential for them to increase their blessings by allowing poor people to continue living, to continue surviving with access to this food and these fruits. And they use that tool in the wrong way. And so they didn't fulfill its potential. They actually damaged it. They actually regressed, subhanAllah. The second link is we mentioned that some people might use the power of the pen to commit evil in this world and to disobey God and to spread corruption and so on and so forth. These people had a blessing, a tool, a, a gift from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that could have been used for good. Can you imagine someone who was righteous, who has a garden, and they know that poor people are able to eat from this garden, and they are living, they are surviving, you might save many lives, you are sustaining their lives. Do you know how much barak is coming your way, that you are in this position, this, 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 uh, this huge blessing, subhanAllah, that you have so much property and land and fruits, but because you want more profits, you are willing to take profits over people. And this is a disgrace to that blessing. This is a type of uh, ingratitude to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala protect us. There are people today in the United States of America, especially, and around the world, who are choosing profits over people. There are people in different communities who choose personal benefit over community benefit. And the reality is the believer is always looking for these opportunities. In fact, when this opportunity came to them, they should have said, Alhamdulillah, that these poor people are coming to our garden. Perhaps that's why Allah still sustains our garden. Perhaps that's why we still have this blessing. And it's increasing every year with every season. And they did the opposite. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala guide us and protect us and forgive us for all of our shortcomings. Allahumma ameen. Uh, with my comment about uh, prophets over people, I'm not only referring to uh, politics here. But it is definitely a part of it, because when you consider the political conversation and you consider the economic inequality in the United States, a big part of it is because of corporations, because in this country, corporations with their wealth can buy out politicians and pretty much buy out some of the uh, policy making in this country. And because they are able to affect the policies in this country, they are able to effectively control the country. They are able to continue to increase the disparity between the rich and the poor in this country, where you have people in the United States who are dying all the time because they don't have access to basic needs. And other people are doing what? The, the, the ultra rich, they are thriving off of the work of these, uh, let's say first uh, and, and lower and middle class. And the reality is that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala would want us in such a position to change the equation, to change the system, to work for something greater, something that would allow people who don't have access to food or basic health care or just to survive, just to live another day, to be able to access that, especially, especially when you have some people who are living what with billions of dollars, which clearly no human being needs. And this is this is really far from moral values. This is far from morality. This is something that Islamic economics and Islamic law would not accept. 
And so if you're able to advocate for something or work towards changing something as a Muslim, you are required to eliminate or at least decrease harm in society. So if there's something you can do or something you can say to decrease this type of uh, immorality and injustice and zulm oppression in society, you are required to do so. In fact, some of you might not like uh, this following statement, but because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is telling us uh, about this disbeliever of Quraysh and then later on the story of the people of the garden who are preventing others from accessing the garden, you have to ask yourself, what if you were watching as this took place? Now this took place and nobody else was able to advise them or stop them. It was these, let's say, brothers, this group of people who did what they wanted to do, they committed that sin. If you were able to change that, religiously speaking, you saw that some people were going to die because they did not have access to food. And you could advise, at the very least, you could advise these people not to do what they're doing. Or if you cannot do that, you can bring about to other people in society and say, hey, let's all advise them collectively. Let's pressure them. Let's all say something because collectively the voices are stronger. Are you required to do so? I'll leave the answer for you. And I think it's a very obvious one. And coming back to the present time in the United States, if you are able to decrease so, uh, the, the, the immorality and injustice in society by doing something or saying something or addressing something individually or collectively, then you cannot stand on the side and simply watch. You cannot allow this injustice, this manna'in lil khair to continue doing what he is doing, whether at an individual level or a collective level. You are required to be part of the change process. We don't just watch on the sidelines as Muslims. We are part of the solution wherever and whenever. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala utilize all of us. Allahumma ameen. Moving on to the next passage, 23, 24, and 25. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, and now this is the story uh, continuing. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, فَانْطَلَقُوا وَهُمْ يَتَخَافَتُونَ So they went off, whispering to one another. This is now the next morning. They intended something evil. They made a plan and they went to sleep. And there are people today making plans all the time to restrict access to healthcare and food and basic survival needs for the average human being in this country, for people who are struggling every single day. And they are benefiting off of this in the billions while other people are working three and four jobs and still cannot afford basic needs and their children are dying, their family members are dying all the time. And they are, these individuals plotting, planning, doing what they want to do and trying to keep people far from access to khayr. This group of people the next morning are talking to one another as they set off, whispering. Why are they whispering? They're doing something wrong. They're whispering because they're trying to hide their sin. They're trying to avoid being caught. And they know that they are doing something wrong. They are saying what? As they are whispering, do not allow any poor person to enter your garden today. This is referring to the garden. Today, upon you, do not allow any poor person to enter today. Meaning, upon this garden. And they proceeded early, totally fixated on their purpose. And I want us to consider here the word hard. Verse 25. The word hard in the Arabic language is used for hindering and withholding for a purpose, for uh, something that is uh, of your resolution, for making haste. Totally fixated on their purpose. I want us to consider the following three points. Every believer who is able to should consider the needs of others who are struggling, the poor, the needy, the homeless, the oppressed, widows and orphans and others as well. And consider them, I don't just mean with uh, one off sadaqah here and there, or when somebody tells you there's a fundraiser, go ahead and donate. Or you see a campaign on social media and you give. Alhamdulillah, that's great. Consider that as part of your life plan as well. Oftentimes, our life goals are not inclusive of solving some of these great problems in society. How can you, the person who's watching this right now, how can you as an individual who is listening to this lecture right now, who's listening to this reminder right now, how can you make the lives of the poor and the homeless and the oppressed better? What portion of your income do you give to facilitate change and to help others as well specifically? This good intention in your life, part of your income, for example, is always given to charity. This good intention of life planning 
that is inclusive of resolving homelessness and poverty uh, and people's, people's uh, need for food, starvation. If you make this part of your life mission as well, in addition to your general life mission, you will realize your good intention and your efforts, of course, will bring so many blessings into your life. Wallahi, it will bring so many blessings into your life. Number two, look at the status of the masakeen in the sight of Allah. These people are saying, And because of that, Allah punished these evil people. Allah knows what is in the hearts of these specific masakeen, these particular individuals. And he blessed certain people and he punished others through how they treated these masakeen. Focus on your relationship and your status with Allah. The next time you see an opportunity to help someone in need, don't come up with 55, 100, 5,000 excuses about not giving. When you see another charity project, campaign, like even if it's a dollar, five dollars, whatever you're able to do, you know what you're able to do. Don't tell yourself you can't. Don't tell yourself they're going to waste it. Don't tell yourself this is not real. Of course, assuming that it is uh, something authentic, give and be generous and Allah will bless you. Focus on your relationship and your status with Allah. For these people might have nothing in terms of the worldly wealth. They might be looked down upon. They have no social media. They might not have following. They don't have homes in many cases. But their status with Allah is greater than the person who had access to an entire garden. The person who had all of this wealth. That poor person was better in the sight of Allah than that rich person. Don't focus on your material wealth to judge and look around and assess where people are. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala forgive us. And number three, and the last point here. Everyone has some ultimate reference point for morality. When you define something as good or evil, justice, injustice, where is this coming from? For us, it comes from the Quran and Sunnah. For these people, it was their own desires, their own nafs and their own hawa, their own greed, their desire for more wealth and their status that they considered masakeen as people who should not access their garden. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala forgive us and utilize all of us to resolve many of the problems of society. Allahumma ameen, Allahumma ameen. So these individuals are acting like only they will know their plan, right? They forgot about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Now remember, we mentioned before, with the beginning of the story, that the context is what? That these are believers. The context was that the father was a generous man, and he used to give access uh, to the poor people. He used to give them access to this garden for food. And the three sons, uh, if, the, if they are only three sons, the sons were not like the father, right? So the level of religiosity was different here. And they, they, they got a little greedy here. And even the sons may not all be the same, but they forgot about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. They forgot about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Now, I'm going to give you here something very interesting, which is that someone might see this situation and say, well, I don't see what the problem is. What do I mean by this? These are people who own a garden. And from this garden, every morning, uh, obviously, you come to the garden, you find that some of the fruits have fallen. And so some poor people will come every morning. They don't have any food. And they will take only the fruits that have fallen. Because these fruits that have fallen, they feel like these are for everyone, especially the fruits that have fallen outside of the garden. And they'll move on. And so someone might see this and say, well, it's better for these rich people and it's their right to control who has access to the garden. And they should be able to prevent anyone they want from accessing the garden. And then later, if they want, they can decide to give some charity to the poor people. Some people will see that and say that's what they believe uh, is, is uh, legitimate, is more correct, or is at least a type of correct approach. And that is far from reality. These people had access and they inherited a blessing upon many blessings, a massive garden. That's not the only blessing. The fact that poor people were accessing the garden was a blessing. And for you to cut off access to life, this is life for these people to cut it off when they need it to survive and you are going to hide it so that they cannot find it. This is an injustice upon many injustices. So they plan and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, of course, is aware of their plan. The second response, as Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave you, he can also take away from you. Whatever Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave you, he can take away. And in fact, everything Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives you, he can take away. لِلَّهِ مَا أَخَذَ وَلَهُ مَا أَعْطَى and we say this when someone has passed away, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave us even the people in our lives. And the people in our lives will not even last. So remember that so that you do not become greedy or arrogant or lose sight of what really matters. Cherish what you have, utilize that moment, that time, that blessing for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Another reflection here, uh, they whispered while wanting to commit evil. So we should uh, uh, we should be vocal in spreading a jazakum al 
Good. So you have here what a da'wah strategy. Some people here are plotting in private and they are secretive. So you should be the opposite when it comes to khayr, when it comes to good. Spread the khayr and share it on social media. Make it powerful, make it uh, creative, make it intelligent, make it uh, coherent to people that is applicable to people. It is for the target audience. It is something people will hear. Spread all the words of khayr, all the good that you can spread, spread it far and wide. And the last point here, inshallah, that is shared, never stop a good deed. Jazakum khayr. All of these are excellent answers and excellent reflections. Never stop a good deed. You have here an inheritance of a good deed. Can you imagine? They inherited something from their father. And he was already giving uh, sadaqah through his land. This was why the land was blessed. And so they cut off access to a good deed and, of course, access to life to those who needed it. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala punished them for that. They had a ni'mah and they threw it away. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to forgive all of us for our shortcomings. Allahumma ameen. Verses 26 to 29. Okay, now they've reached the garden the next morning with their plot and their plan. And what, what happens? They saw it devastated. They saw the burnt ashes of the garden that was there. Destroyed, desolate land, as though there is no garden. And they said, Now this has two meanings. And sometimes people get confused here with this phrase, Inna ladallun. It means we must have lost our way, like we're lost. This is not our garden, clearly. And the second, and uh, that you can combine the two, is that there is no way that this is our garden. Meaning, what happened? We must have done so much evil. What happened? In fact, we are now deprived. We're deprived of livelihood. And this is interesting. We are deprived of livelihood after preventing other people from their livelihood. And then one of them said, The most sensible, the most sensible amongst these brothers. He said, didn't I tell you guys to say, subhanAllah, or in this case also, Allah willing, God willing, didn't I tell you to say, inshallah, didn't I tell you to remember Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? And then they said, They said, glory be to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We were truly wrongdoers. We have been sinful. So on seeing the garden, some scholars say, they didn't even believe it was their garden. That's how completely changed it was of a land. And they said, perhaps we've lost our way and come to another place. But when they realized, no, guys, this is really our garden. This is really our garden, completely destroyed. They said, we are mahrumun and we are dalun, meaning we are misguided. We are wrongdoers. And one of them said, Now, there are several lessons we can take here before we proceed with the story. The remembrance of Allah is a shield against sinfulness. The remembrance of Allah as a way of life will protect you throughout your life. And this is why we should always be praying. Allahumma a'inna ala dhikrika wa shukrika wa husna ibadatik. Oh Allah, help us to remember you often, regularly, to praise you and thank you regularly and to worship you in the best manner possible. The dhikr of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, that remembrance, when you build that habit and it's always on your heart, uh, in your heart and on your tongue all the time as a way of life, you're thinking about Allah, it's in your actions, you're with good friends, there's reminders, you have knowledge, you have the Quran playing, this will protect you from saying the wrong thing and doing the wrong thing. So make sure in your daily life you are building an atmosphere, a lifestyle, so that you are on the day of judgment amongst al-dhakirin Allah kathiran wa dhakirat may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make us from amongst them number two tasbih in particular so there's a lot of types of dhikr there are many forms of remembrance of God tasbih to say subhanallah how perfect Allah is tasbih in particular is something many of us have become heedless with glorifying Allah regularly is a powerful life changer it is a source of relief for all of our hardships. It is a sign of attachment to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. How do we know that this will relieve you of your hardships if you go through any hardships? If you remember Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, فَلَوْلَا أَنَّهُ كَانَ مِنَ الْمُسَبِّحِينَ لَبِتَ فِي بَطْنِهِ إِلَىٰ يَوْمِ يُبْعَثُونَ Referring to Prophet Yunus alayhi salam. Had he not been amongst those who made tasbih, who remembered Allah and glorified Allah, he would have remained in the belly of the whale until the end of times. Number three. So when they started making this plan and they said, we will steal the fruits of the garden, we'll pluck the fruits early so that poor people cannot access it. This person amongst the brothers had warned them. Have you forgotten Allah? 
Have you forgotten to say, if Allah wills, that you want to pluck the garden? But they did not listen to this person. And what's interesting about this is that awsatuhum, some scholars say, think of ummatan wasata, that you are the moderate, balanced person. Balance not meaning, oh, I don't do this or that. No, the balanced person meaning on the right path. The one on the right path amongst them, the, the most righteous and religious amongst them in that moment. He said, are you forgetting Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? Are you forgetting uh, to forgetting to glorify Allah's perfection? Now, they were making up their mind and their minds not to give anything away to the poor. He again maybe advised them, remember Allah, stay away from evil intentions. But they insisted in what they had planned. Number four, someone of wisdom and religiosity and piety spoke from amongst them and reminded them, therefore, be a person who reminds others. Insist on being a person of reminders. And do not be ashamed, brothers and sisters, of reminding others. And of course, of practicing the reminder yourself. Do not be embarrassed reminding your family, your parents, your spouse, your children, your friends online. There's so many resources. There's so much access to remind other people when they have forgotten. And don't wait for someone else to do it. Don't wait for some imam to post about it or someone who is a scholar or someone who uh, has all the hadith, uh, let's say, memorized. If you can remind people about something, remind them about something. As long as you know what it is, you are reminding them about. Another benefit here, another reflection, is that this is a reminder about good company and people who are receptive to advice. When someone in your group, wherever you are, whatever you're deciding to do, reminds you guys of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, reminds you all of something good. Don't ignore that person. That might be the blessing from Allah in that gathering that would protect all of you from punishment or sin. When someone reminds all of you of something good, don't put them down or laugh about them. Sometimes in a group of people in a gathering, someone says, guys, let, let, let's stop backbiting. I don't feel comfortable with this. And other people start mocking, laughing. What do you mean? What's wrong with you? You were just talking with us. You were backbiting too. The fact that someone reminded you to do something good and to stop a sin, follow that advice. That is a blessing from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The arrogant person is the one who doubles down. Another reflection here. The story mentions their response when they committed the sin and they saw the punishment of Allah wipe out their garden. What did they say? We were wrong. They glorified Allah and they said, we were indeed wrong. The believer sees suffering and pain as a reason to get closer to Allah. To double down on one's arrogance or mistake is contrary to the methodology of Adam Islam. It's the way of the devil. For someone to see suffering in their life after committing a sin and then to commit more sins or become more distant from God is a type of arrogance and pride and stubbornness. So when we go through hardship, we should come back to Allah. These people saw that they did something wrong and now they were basically awakened when this entire garden is wiped out. And what did they do? They repented. They admitted, first of all, they acknowledged, inna kunna dhalimi. we were wrong. We oppressed, we were wrongdoers. Another reflection here. The believer is always and also receptive and aware of Allah's signs around them and within them. See beyond what is happening. See beyond what is happening in the world and look to the deeper signs, the blessing of Allah, al latif We mentioned this in Surah Al-Mulk, the signs that connect people to God. Some people can see a pebble or, or a rock and remember Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And other people will see a miracle and still ignore God. Some people will see a leaf and say, subhanallah. Other people will see the splitting of the sea and still pursue the Prophet Musa alayhi salam to attack. And some people will see mu'jizat upon mu'jizat and they will hear the Quran, the final mu'jizat, and they will ignore it. And other people, subhanallah, will see a cup of water and say, subhanallah. Alhamdulillah, this water is a blessing from Allah. This is the, the sustenance of life that Allah created in this world. Look all around you and within you and re recognize everything as a sign, as a way to link you back to Allah. I mentioned before the example during this pandemic that you have access to a blessing Allah will ask you about. Technology, a smartphone, your internet. Your internet is a blessing and also a trial. Every megabyte, every gigabyte of data that's something you will be questioned about. And so when we consider all of these blessings, we consider as well that these are signs. Do you see this sign right now? The fact that you are watching this live video from somewhere else, from within your home, from other states as well, mashallah. Do you recognize this sign? 
ayatullah fil kawm? Do you recognize when you look outside and it's now fall season, it's the autumn season, leaves are falling. Allah is aware of every single leaf that falls and every leaf that did not fall and every leaf that could have fallen. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is aware of every leaf that fell last fall as well and every leaf that will fall in the future. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is aware of every drop of rain in this world, every single drop of water on earth and all across the universe. Allah is aware of every single thing in his universe. وَهُوَ بِكُلِّ شَيْءٍ عَلِيمٌ اللَّهُ خَالِقُ كُلِّ شَيْءٍ وَهُوَ عَلَى كُلِّ شَيْءٍ وَكِيلٌ Allah is the creator of all things and he is the one who manages and has power over all things. Think about all of these beautiful and wonderful and magnificent signs and wallahi your heart will stay attached to Allah. Every time you look at your phone, your computer, your camera, whatever it is you're doing, this camera right here is a sign. And may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make us amongst people who notice these signs and praise him for it. The people who see signs of God in the universe, they are those who remember Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala while standing, while sitting, and while on their sides. What are they doing? They are thinking about what the creation of the universe, the heavens and the earth. And then as a result of reflecting on signs, what naturally will you think and say? Our Lord, you did not create all of this without purpose. We don't exist without purpose. We have a clear purpose. Subhanak, you are too perfect and above such a thing to create something like this aimlessly. Subhanaka faqina adhab al-nar Oh Allah, you are so perfect. Oh Allah, you control things. Oh Allah, you created this world. So protect us from the punishment of the fire. Signs all around and within. And number nine, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions this group of brothers. He mentions their sin, but also mentions their tawbah, their repentance, to show that redemption matters more than the sin itself. They were still alive and still had hope. And don't, don't misunderstand me. This does not mean the sin does not matter. But the redemption is highlighted here. Others who are mentioned in the Quran were evil. They were arrogant. They received signs of God. They received miracles of God like the camel uh, with Prophet Salih salam, like the splitting of the sea with Prophet Musa salam. They saw these signs and yet they rejected them. And now that was their last chance. So they were punished and they died with the punishment as well, in the punishment as well. This group of brothers saw a punishment from Allah and returned to Allah. They did not double down on their sin. They did not become even more arrogant and dis disconnected and distant from God. So long as your heart is beating, you still have hope. So long as your heart is beating, you still have hope. But hurry, you don't know when you'll take your last breath. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us redemption and grant us a lifestyle of tawbah where we recognize that we can always turn back to God, but we don't have time. You are always in a rush to go back to Allah. You are never in a rush to become distant from Him. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala protect us and forgive us and guide us. Allahumma ameen. Do not lose hope and do not restrict the mercy of Allah from others. Do not make others feel like there's no hope for them. Bring others closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's mercy, but remind them they don't have much time left. There isn't much time left. So there's an element of mercy, but there's also an element of fear. That you don't want to be like those mentioned in the Quran who ignored that sign when it came to them for the last time and then they died upon that sinful state. May Allah protect us. Allahumma ameen. And the last passage in Surah Al Qalam, uh, or sorry, in the story uh, of the, the people of the garden, Surah Al Qalam, verses 30 to 33. So they said, Subhana Rabbina inna kunna dhalameen. Now what happened? They started turning to one another and blaming one another. They're blaming. They are blaming one another. What did they say? Woe to us. We have certainly transgressed. We've certainly done something wrong. And now they're hopeful. Perhaps our Lord will give us something better than this garden, better in its place. We truly turn to him in hope. We turn to him with hope. Allah says this is our punishment, meaning in this world. But the punishment of the hereafter is, is certainly far worse. If only they truly knew. If only people knew. If only the Meccans of Quraysh knew. 
some reflections here. We'll, we'll cover at least 10 reflections, inshallah, and then we'll ask you one final question for critical thinking. These individuals all started to blame one another. Why? Because someone said, let's do this, and someone else agreed with it, and someone else had uh, proceeded with it. Maybe some of them thought of it, some of them devised it, some of them corrected a flaw in it. They all planned this, but now they're blaming one another. And they had forgotten Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and insisted on doing something evil. Number two, the believer is not always looking for someone to blame, but rather you're looking for what? Corrections, solutions, learning lessons from the past, from the mistake. The blame game is problematic as a general habit. Now, does this mean we don't assign blame or fault to people in certain situations? We do, of course. And with a business, for example, someone made a huge mistake. They are to blame for it. There may be consequences for it. But the believers in general, especially when you're talking here about a group of people, do not play the blame game. If you're always looking for someone to blame, you'll never look at yourself. If you're always looking for someone to blame, you'll never see your own faults. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala guide us. There are some people who sit down and all they do on social media is criticize others. They sit down and all they do is critique others. Everyone is doing everything wrong. Our community is misled. Everyone is misguided. Everyone is a sellout. Everyone is a liberal uh, sellout. Everyone is this and that. And they start insulting, creating fitness in the community, critiquing, criticizing everyone. And they themselves are not doing anything to solve the problems. In fact, they are creating problems for the community. The blame game. And they don't see that perhaps they are part of another problem in the community. They are not solving it. They are making things worse. Does this mean we cannot advise? Of course, we must advise. Of course, everyone will have their role and, and uh, a specific position and specific qualifications, knowledge of the situation, all of that. But the blame game should not be a personality type, should not be who you are. Number three, some people refuse to become better because they always want to blame someone or something for their situation for their circumstances, for their shortcomings, for their lack of self-discipline, for their laziness. There's always going to be someone or something to blame if you want to play that game. But the wise, intelligent, mature, resolved, strong-willed, sincere believer accepts responsibility and moves forward towards progress and towards Allah. Rabbana zalamna anfusana, Adam and Hawa alayhim salam What did they say when Allah condemned them for eating from the tree? Did they say, shaitan tricked us, ya Allah? Shaitan told us to do this. Shaitan promised us false promises. No. They said, rabbana zalamna anfusana. We have wronged ourselves. Wa illam lana wa tarhamna, min if you don't have mercy on us and forgive us, we will surely be amongst the losers. The devil did the opposite. The devil blamed. Who did he blame? The devil blamed Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Bima aghwaitani. He said, you, you caused me to do this. Did Allah force the devil to do that? No. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave him a command. What, what did the devil mean by that? He said, Why? Because you created Adam. And the devil became arrogant and envious, jealous of Adam. Do not play the blame game with your own circumstances in life. There are things in your life and all of our lives that we cannot control, and they were given to us. You cannot control where you were born or who your parents are. These are things you cannot control. However, there are things within your control. If you are going to blame your family, your society, that everyone is corrupt, everyone is bad, which is not true, everyone is wrong, which is not true. If you're going to always look for some reason to blame someone else, you are not going to accept responsibility for your own actions. And if you don't accept responsibility and you don't take responsibility, what happens? You don't progress in life. You don't become a better person. If you keep saying the reason I'm as, as I am today is because of my situation, and you have the ability to change your situation, then there's no one to blame but yourself. You can't blame the devil. You can't blame your parents. Why? Because you reach a certain point in your life in which you are old enough to understand and mature enough to understand that you have free will. You have decisions to make. Every day you make thousands of decisions, major and minor. When you make these decisions all the time, you have to realize that you can change your situation by the will of Allah. So if someone, for example, let's say, is blaming everyone for their health and they can change their health. Why are you blaming others? Someone is blaming their parents or their community for not being religious. Why are you blaming the community? Can you become religious? Can you do something about it? Can you get yourself closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? Do that. Don't play the blame game with your life. Otherwise, you will think in your mind that you're always the victim. And if you think with, with, with regards to this victim identity and victim culture, 
that you are always the victim of so many circumstances so you cannot progress and proceed, you won't progress or proceed. You want to become a better person, be strong-willed, be mature, accept that when things are out of your control, they're out of your control, but so much is within your control. And that is what you are held accountable for. You want to become the best person you can possibly be. You want to reach the greatest version of yourself. You have to accept responsibility for all of your actions every single day. We all need to do that. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala accept from all of us. Allah ma'ameen. Number four, redemption comes with hope. Perhaps Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will replace this situation with a better one now that we learned our lesson. So redemption here, they are trying to redeem themselves by turning to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Qadu subhana rabbina inna kunna darim, right? And that redemption also came with hope. They said perhaps Allah will replace our situation with a better one. Why? Because now we learned our lesson. Now we have repented. Now we have remorse. Number five, redemption also comes with hopes of forgiveness and moving onwards. Beware of losing hope after you, you perform tawbah, repentance. Perhaps Allah will elevate your ranks beyond your imagination because of how sincere you were in your tawbah and how much remorse and regret you had. Number six, in this particular story, the owners of the garden hoped for a replacement and they put their trust in Allah. And what's amazing about this, if you think about what they just lost, they lost a garden that takes so much effort and money, capital and investments and also a lot of time for that garden to get back to the situation it was in before. For a garden to come back like the one that they had would take a long time and a lot of effort. And yet their standard was high in their hope in Allah. Their standard in terms of how much hope they had was that they hoped Allah would give them something even better than what they lost. Number seven, if an opportunity in life passes by you and you miss it, or a situation in general is not what you like, pray to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala optimistically that, uh, and, and you recognize as you're praying to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the one who says, kun fayakun, pray to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala optimistically for a situation that is better than the one that you lost. And remember these words, asa rabbuna an yubdilana khayra minha. Asa rabbuna an yubdilana khayra, right? From what you lost or what you had. Number eight, even after a punishment, it is possible for people to return to Allah. And it is necessary to still think good of Allah and what he can provide for you. Some people will fail during that moment. Some people will fail that test in life. And the, a lot of people don't realize that this test is happening all the time. So what ends up happening, they double down on their sinfulness. They double down on their arrogance. May Allah protect us. Number nine, everything in this life comes and goes. People come and go as well. Nothing worldly is guaranteed. And you and I, we are not entitled to anything in this world. The only thing we know for sure, the only thing we are all guaranteed of in this world is that we will leave this world. As for what you have today, it's not guaranteed for tomorrow, but may Allah preserve all that we have. Number 10, some people will fail tests and punishments due to their own arrogance or their temptations or their ignorance. Arrogance and temptations, these are very obvious. The third one, ignorance, is not jahan, jahan murakkab as well, compounded ignorance. Ignorance is for someone to think that hardship, whether a trial or a punishment, should be a reason to feel so bad about everything pertaining to God in the afterlife or this world, or that it symbolizes Allah's anger and therefore a person has no hope. And no, this is far from reality. Some people think that punishment means that they should not come back to God, that they will necessarily commit another sin. And this is not true. And this is an example of that. This is a trick of the devil. Frankly, it is ignorance for a person to, to think that because a punishment came into their life, they cannot get closer to God. That is a choice you make every single day. Hardship, difficulty should cause you to think twice about the matter. If it is a punishment, take it as a sign that you are still alive and you should go back to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala while you still have hope, while you're still breathing. Admit your sin, confess to Allah, repent to Allah and go back to him. Because the punishment of the next life is eternal. Meaning the punishment that is coming, It is much worse. So if Allah punishes anyone in this world, and they're still alive, they're still breathing, 
they better repent and go back to Allah because they were lucky not to have died during that punishment because the punishment of the next life is much worse. And if it's not a punishment, but a test, a trial, use it to turn to Allah, closer to Allah, ask for increased status, relief, patience, and forgiveness. And the last point here, no matter how bad the punishment is for some people in this world, when you see people of evil killing many people, hurting other people, attacking people of religion, murdering the people of religion, people of Islam, when you see this happening, and then you see them experience any kind of punishment, just remember the punishment of the hereafter is unimaginably more severe. So a person should take heed, become humble, fear with regards to your shortcomings and your sins, and work harder to earn the mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Barakallahu feekum. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.